Over the next two weeks, I want to introduce to you a two-part vision series concerning the church of the living God, and in particular, the church at this local assembly known as Crossover Bible Fellowship. I'd like to reorient us around the reason that God has called us to be a church, the reason that God has called us together as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to recenter and or refocus our minds on what the church really is. If you know Jesus and you're familiar with him and you are a part of his assembly, one of the things that you try to do, that you seek out to do in your life is unite yourself with a local fellowship of believers. You want to be a part of the local church. You want to be a part of a place called home, a place that is family to you where other people share your beliefs about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done and the work of the Spirit of the living God and the work of the Father. You want to be a part of that. And many of us will go throughout our lives and we will go from church to church trying to find what we would think is the perfect church. We're trying to find a place that we would call home and say, this feels right. Let's stay here. Let's root ourselves here. It's called, in our minds, the perfect church. And so this series that we're doing today is a series about the perfect church. It is about a titled message called Perfect Witnesses. That if anybody is going to be a part of the perfect church, there ought to be characteristics of that church. Now the problem is, is that when you're a part of the so-called perfect church, you realize inside of the perfect church are imperfect people. And inside of the perfect church are imperfect situations. Inside of the perfect church are imperfect relationships with your brothers and sister. And you really ask yourself, how in the world can there be a perfect church when there are imperfect people? How in the world can we be a part of the perfect church when we don't even handle situations the perfect way? That there might be some situations that I've been disappointed by. The elders didn't handle this right. The deacons didn't handle this right. The leaders didn't do this right. And so I'm sitting there evaluating other people and looking at their imperfections and saying, obviously this can't be the perfect church, but I'm going to stay here because it's just a little bit more perfect than the last one I left. So I want to find out what does it mean to be perfect because whenever you say the perfect church, there's a thing that comes to your mind in terms of that word perfect. And so I want to help us define this word perfect. This word perfect means to reach the end of or to complete a process, to be complete in all parts, to be full grown, nothing lacking or lacking in nothing. It comes from going through the necessary stages to reach the end goal. To think about the word perfect biblically where Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 48, you are to be perfect for your heavenly father is perfect. It's this meaning right here. It means to reach the end or the completion of a process. That the father starts you out in a process, but he's trying to complete something in you and I and we have to go through various stages to get to the stage of perfection that he's actually looking for. He wants us to be complete in all parts. He does not want us to lack anything. He, he, he wants everything to fit just perfectly and to work out the way to the end of the process. But in order to be perfect, you've got to go through something. In order to be perfect, there's got to be trial and tribulation. In order to be perfect, there's got to be storms and situations that are difficult, that bring you to the place of perfection. That it's not that you do 100% of things right 100% of the times. That's not the perfect that he's talking about. It is the perfect that I'm going to take you through some seasons in your life that are going to be difficult, and I want to see how you come through to see if the part came together to get you to the end or desired position. See, that you don't start out as big as I'm going to make you. You might actually start out small. But by the time I allow these situations and tribulations, these trials and storms to come across your path, by the end of it, you'll be perfect. See, you, you, you want easy perfect. He says, no, that ain't how it goes down. What's the picture of it, Pastor? Well, here it is. 
It is the picture of a pirate's telescope. In the Greek, you would realize that a pirate's telescope starts out small. But when the pirate begins to stretch out the telescope to look down the road, you will see that although it started out small, there were components of the telescope that as you stretched it out from side to side, it only got to the point that it was perfect or complete, having gone through the full process, lacking nothing, that it could only see clearly when it was totally stretched out. That telescope is not at its best when it's short, although you can still see through it. Although you went out one layer, it cannot, it is only at its best when it is totally stretched out. When you see the end of the stretching of the telescope that starts small and it is stretched totally out, that's when you see it being a perfect telescope. That's when you see it being able to perform what it was designed for. That is what it means to be perfect. To go through a process, to be stretched out all the way to where you can see clearly what God was trying to do. But then you talk about this thing called the church. And it says, people who are called out from the world and to God. The universal total body of believers whom God calls out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. It is those who have been called out by the Kyrios. The Lord himself, that God has called you and I out from among the world. In other words, it is like the NBA draft. That when the NBA draft comes, there are thousands of college basketball players, yet thousands of college basketball players who have completed the process of playing college ball do not hear their names called at the NBA draft. You didn't get that? The season's over? It's like the NFL draft. It is that many players have played college basketball, played in the Southeast Conference, played in the Big 12, completed, and yet when the NFL draft is called, there are only certain names that are called. And although there are a lot of people who played, there were only certain people who were chosen by an owner who had a GM who was willing to pay their contract. You didn't catch it. There are only a few people who have been called by the Father who have a GM named Jesus Christ who was willing to pay your contract by his blood at the cross. It is Jesus Christ. He is the owner. But then not only that, they then give you a jersey with your name on it. But he don't do that. He gives you a jersey with that Holy Ghost name on it that you wear around and on the inside of you. Not on the outside, but on the inside of you. It's the church. The church is not a facility. The church is a family. The church is not a building. The church is a body. It is a facility that facilitates his ministry. It is a body who builds his believers. That's what the church is. The church is not this building that you come to on 12332 Perry Road. So you don't say, I go to church. You say, I am the church. That when you really think about the perfect church, you don't think about an institution. You ought to think about the individual. And before you think about any other individual as a part of the perfect church, you ought to think about yourself. So when you begin to evaluate the imperfections of the church, you might want to start with yourself. So if the church isn't perfect, let's talk about the evaluator. Because God is not trying to get you to evaluate other believers. God is trying to get you to become the perfect church. Which means you've gone through the process to get to the place of completion of what God really wants you to be. So that you understand that the church is not a social club. The church is a house of redeemed sinners that Jesus Christ has shed his blood for. They are blood-bought, born-again believers, purchased by the Lamb. That's the church. So if you want to say, am I a part of the perfect church? Just look at yourself. Don't look any further than yourself. And then you need to figure out, if I'm a part of the perfect church, and I am the perfect church, then am I doing what perfect Christians do? Church is not a facility. It's those who recognize what Christ has done on his work in the cross and have believed in his death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection on our behalf. That is the church. Watch this, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. The Bible says Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Now, the question is, who is him? It's Stephen 
who he's just killed and authorized the stoning of in Acts 7, verse 54 through 60. But watch this. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Now the question is, is this man who had to get put to death by the name of Stephen, how important of a brother is he? And here's the question, could he be considered the perfect church? Watch this. Walk back to Acts 7, verse 54. Now, when they heard this, he had just preached about Jesus. They were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven. Watch this. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and covered their ears, and rushed with one impulse. And when they had driven him out to the, out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the young man's na- uh, feet named Saul, and they went on stoning Stephen. And as he called on the Lord, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. I believe that Stephen was a part of the perfect church. And watch this. How do you believe that, Pastor? Because when Stephen had preached Jesus, the people did not receive the Jesus that he preached. And then when he preached Jesus and they didn't receive the Jesus that he preached, they began to stone him. Why? Because the message was convicting them of their sins. And they began to stone him. And when they began to stone him, he said, I'm not worried about stoning. There's nowhere in the text that he says, ouch. There's nowhere he says that. He says, no, I looked up into heaven while being stoned, while going through a process to where people are getting ready to try to kill me, and I saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, some of y'all who've been to church a little while, you're going to get it in just a second. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Y'all, 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 y'all get in just, just a few, about two more seconds. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and ascended into heaven, he seated himself at the right hand of the Father. But Stephen sees him, and Stephen says, I see him standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, when he sees him standing at the right hand of the Father, the question is, why is he standing? He's standing because Stephen says, a Lord, receive my spirit, and don't hold this sin against him. Maybe you heard that before. Maybe you heard Jesus Christ on the cross say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, receive my spirit. You might be catching this in about two minutes. In other words, he died just like Jesus. He died with the same mindset. He died with the same attitude. He died with the same actions. And as a result of the way he died and his request, Saul slash Paul gets saved. Now watch how perfect his life is. Because of this man, we'll talk about it in three weeks from now, because of this man's death, you now have the book of James. The reason why you have James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and all the epistles in the Bible is because God allowed this man to go through a process to where he was killed and stoned proclaiming the name of Jesus. Now, you want to go to a church where you like folk. But this believer right here was not liked by the world. Why? Because he was preaching Jesus regardless. If you're a part of the perfect church, let me ask you this question in evaluation. How much do you preach Jesus? And here's the question. When you die, will Jesus give you a standing ovation? When you die, will Jesus watch the way you're dying individually? Now, it's other folk dying at the exact same time across the world as Stephen's dying. But yet, when Stephen dies, Jesus takes note of Stephen and the way he dies. And he sees that he's completed this process to perfection and maturity to where he's got the same. He's not crying while he's dying. He is calling on the name of Jesus. He's seeing glorious things while being stoned. And when Jesus sees Stephen dying, he gets up off. Excuse me, Father. Excuse me. Excuse me, Holy Ghost. But let me just go on and give this boy down here a standing ovation. The question is, is if you're looking for the perfect church, that when you die, will he give you a standing ovation? Or will he say, come on in. 
glad you made it because I died for you. I want to talk to you about the perfect church. What are the characteristics of the perfect church? Check this out in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That's Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered. Watch this. Throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Here it is, the first point. In the perfect church, God will use men's evil intentions to fulfill his gospel instructions. Notice this, is that there is a stoning of Stephen. And then not only is there a stoning of Stephen, but then the Bible says a great persecution arose against the church on that day. And when a great persecution arose against the church, it was that Stephen was not just the only one that they wanted to stop. We want to stop the entire church of God. We want to stop this entire movement of people who are believing in the way, the truth, and the life. We want to stop the church. But Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, in other words, this is the first major attempt of the world trying to shut the church down. It is Saul trying to shut the church down. And any time there are people working against the progress of God's mission in the church, they are part of the gates of hell. You didn't catch what I just said. Saul was a part of the gates of hell that was trying to destroy God's church. But he said, but the gates of hell will not prevail trying to destroy and or persecute my church. But watch this. But the gates of heaven are so powerful is that it will take one who was operating in the gates of hell trying to shut down the church and pull him into the church. And so now the next 15 chapters from 13 to 28 of the book of Acts are about the man who was once in the gates of hell who was trying to shut down the church. Can I come by your address in your seat right now, knock on your door? You don't realize you and I were a part, just like Saul, of the gates of hell, but he reached down and called us out from among the world into his own kingdom. You got to check this out. What God will do... When evil people try to work and or destroy his church, is God will actually use them to build his church. In other words, I'm going to start using you, Saul, before I even save you to build the church. I'm not going to save you to Acts chapter 9, but I'm going to use your evil intentions to fulfill my gospel instruction. Now, how do you know that? Go back to Acts 8 verse 1. Watch the text. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church. Where? In Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of where? Judea and Samaria. Walk back with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if you don't mind. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, here's how you know you're a part of the perfect church. You're a part of the perfect church if the church is following God's gospel instructions. Check out Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says... The disciples wanted to set an agenda. They said, hey, is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, hey, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Let me tell you what you need right now. I'm going to tell you about this thing in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in where? Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Y'all. A great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Why? Because the church got so good to them, Acts chapter 5 verse 28 says that the name of Jesus and the preaching of Jesus had filled all of Jerusalem. That everybody in Jerusalem had heard the gospel message, but church got so good that it turned into a social club to where we just want to hear Peter preach, we just want to hear James preach, we just want to hear John preach, we just want to see some more miracles, we just want to see some people sharing some more money and some more goods. And church got so good to them that God had to disturb the church. This was not the devil's work, this was God saying, church got too good for y'all, so I got to now split the church up. Because y'all are not going to go do what I called you to do. I told you to go to Judea and Samaria and go preach the gospel, but church got too good in Jerusalem, so I let a dude get killed. 
It's the perfect church. Stephen, I already know you're going to heaven, so here's how you're going to go out. We're going to let some dudes stone you and kill you, and as a result, everybody else is going to start running. But they're going to run to the exact places that I had already designed for them to go. Now, I need to give you a couple things. This word persecution, it means for an animal to hunt down its prey, to totally ravage it, and to totally destroy it. It means for a lion to chase down an antelope, get it in the clutches of its jaws, and or devour it and kill it and leave nothing. That Saul was not playing with the church when the Bible says a great persecution arose. When Luke writes that, he's saying that this man was putting men and women in prison, and he was trying to destroy and ravage and take the church out. That was his goal. But the word scattered jumps in. Can you check out the text? Acts chapter 8, it says, but they were scattered. Now, this word scattered means something totally different. This word scattered, let me show you what it means. It is a sower who sows seeds. The word scatter is a sower who sows seeds. Now, if you know anything about the agricultural world and the farming world, then what you're doing is you have already, watched this, uh, tilled some soil. You've already worked on the ground and all that. And then all of a sudden what you do is you get your, you, you get your seeds and you walk down the aisle and you spread your seeds out. And what are you expecting? You are expecting when you plant your seeds for a harvest to come up from the seeds that have been planted. Which means that, watch this now, is that although a persecution arose against the church to ravage the church, I actually used the persecution so they began to run. But watch this, they don't realize that while they were running, they were actually scattered. So that if you look at negative stuff that happens to you through the lens of what man did to you, you will miss what God is doing in the midst. That's why Joseph said this, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See, you got to stop looking at what man has done and start looking at the gospel and God ordering the steps of the righteous towards the direction that he wants them to go. So here it is in the Bible that they would not have gone to do what God had called them to do had God not intervened. Y'all, can, can, can we stop right here and do a little Bible work? Do you realize that he told them in Genesis 9, verse 1 and 2, I want y'all to go fill the earth? And they stopped in a tower called Babel and began to build that up. And God had to come down and scatter them again. Why? Because man is not prone to follow God's gospel instructions. I don't mind being a part of the church. I just don't want to be the church. Because the real people in the church just don't come to listen to the preacher. The real people in the church go out and preach the gospel. Are you a part of the perfect church? You out there preaching the gospel? Does God have to do something negative in your life? Use a negative to make you call on his name? Use a negative to make you preach his name? Does God have to intervene in some kind of hurtful way to make you just obey what God has called you to do? Does God have to crumble your world around you? Is that what God has to do? Or would it best just be that we followed his instructions? If God said, go and make disciples of all nations, is that best? What does it mean to be a part of the perfect church? Oh, I like the way the choir sings. Well, they're not as good as the choir I used to have. I like the, pre the preacher, but, but he don't hoop. He's a good teacher, though. He don't shout and holler like the, my you know. So, so you evaluating stuff. They don't have this like my old church did, but, but, but they'll be all right. No, no, that ain't the church. The church is people called out by God who realize that God, through the difficult situations of life, is perfecting you and sending you out to fulfill his purpose. We think attending church is good stuff. Attending church is only part of the ball game. Being sent out on mission by God to fulfill his work is what God has called you to do. You wouldn't say somebody was a hooper if they don't ever play in no game. You wouldn't say somebody's a football player if they never played in a game. You wouldn't say somebody's a good cook and they can bake well if they ain't ever cooked no cake. Now, I'm talking about from scratch. I ain't talking about that other stuff. But Big Mama done taught you how to make that thing. Why? Because you got to actually get in the game. So all this coming and evaluating the institution, can I tell you, if you're evaluating the institution, you are off. You are only on as an individual part of the church who realized that God's mission is to send us to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth, preaching the good news. Let's walk through this text a little bit. 
So here it is, he says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That's good news. Except the apostles. Now, that's an interesting point. It says, except the apostles. Because, notice this in the text, is that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says 3,000 people got saved at Pentecost when Peter was preaching. Now, in Acts chapter 1, it says there were 120 people that prepared the church, and now 3,000 got saved. So the church has now grown from your comfortable 120, where everybody knows everybody, to 3,120. We don't all know each other no more. But watch this. But then in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says now 5,000 men are in the church. And it's interesting there because it uses the Greek word andros, not the word anthropos. Anthropos is mankind in general, male and or female. Andros is mankind, meaning male, testosterone, brothers, amen. 5,000 men were in the church. Now, if there are 5,000 men in the church, that means they got some honeys. So at least half of them have married somebody. Amen? I'm going to go with at least half. It's still some single brothers who ain't taking care of their business because there's honeys around. But it's 5,000 of them, men saved, 2,500 women, we'll just say that, married. So they done probably got together with the wife at least one time, which means that there are at least one kid. So now there's 10,000 people in the church. And the Bible says, and they were all scattered except the apostles. Well, the question is, how many apostles are there? I just did some math for you. There are 12. So over 10,000 people exited when Saul, began to church, to, 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 when Saul began to persecute the church, and there are only 12 people left in Jerusalem. The main church only has 12 people left, and they're all the apostles. And over 10,000 people have been scattered out to the regions of Judea and Samaria, and they're going to get down to Antioch and to Cyprus and some other areas. Why? Because they go to fulfill the mission that God has called them to do. They don't realize that there's only a season of preparation at the facility of the church. But when you leave the facility of the church, that's where real ministry begins and you're involved. Watch this thing. So he says, watch this. In the perfect church, God will use our personal problems to propel us to his spiritual purposes. Can you check it out in the text? But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging out men and women, and he would put them in prison. Watch this. Therefore now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Can I share this with you? If you own the run and somebody's got letters to put you in prison, and to put you down, and he's putting men and women up in prison, why would you go preach? Why, why are they chasing you and shutting you down in the first place? They're trying to shut you down in the first place because you're telling them Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead, but nobody here that they're a sinner. See, everybody likes this gospel. God's got a wonderful plan for your life. God wants to do great things. I can see a miracle on the way right now. Your business will be started by this time next year. Everybody like, oh, oh, you ain't even close to no business. You ain't got $3 in your savings account. <laughs> but everybody likes the false gospel. But the real gospel is this. You're a nasty liar, cheat, steal, homosexual, heterosexual freak. You're, 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 you're a drunkard. You're a thief. You're, and, and Jesus Christ died for you. And ain't that good news? And he was buried and was raised. And you, are, you can be forgiven and washed away. And all them freaks that you used to get with at night and you used to call at the, for a midnight booty call, all that that you used to do, that's over. And all of y'all who was opening up your legs, giving it to the dude that called you at a light night booty call, guess what? you can be forgiven for all that and come on into the kingdom and be a deacon in the church. See, you don't want to really hear you were a freak, you were nasty, you were a liar. No, you, you're a liar, you got a bad attitude, you're prideful, you're nasty, you're evil, you're a gossip. No, but Jesus Christ died, praise God he died. Because if he didn't die, I wouldn't be preaching right now. This ain't no social club of good folk. 
Look to the left and right, say, that's a sorry booger right next to me. They got some deep, dark secrets that you ain't even trying to handle in your life. They got some stuff in the midnight hour. Don't be like, oh, man, that's a good brother on road two. That ain't no good brother. That nigga will steal all your stuff out your wallet, amen? Leave it open if you watch this. Verse 3 says, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dropping men, uh, and dragging off men and women, and putting them in prison. And therefore, those who had, watched this, been scattered, went about preaching the word. So God used the scattering to get them to quit listening to the word, to begin to proclaim the word. Because in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer and the fellowship. In other words, they used to listen to the word, but God is tired of you listening to the word. God now wants you to go preach the word. Now watch this. The Bible says they all went about preaching the word. But I didn't see anybody get a license or ordination or something. I got a call to the ministry. I was sleeping. God woke me up in the middle of the night and I saw Psalm 23 on the TV. I didn't see none of that. I didn't see no lightning come down in the middle of my room and God spared me. It came down between my two legs and God came down. You're called. No. You just simply heard the people preach the word of God and the word of God filled you and now you got so much word in you. You got to get it out. Went about preaching the word. And when they preach the word, you ought to know this. If you can't preach nothing, you ought to be able to preach Jesus. I don't care how down your life is right now. I don't care how bad it's fallen to or what place it's gotten you to. If you can't say nothing about church, if, if you don't know what the book of Zechariah or Revelation is about or Ezekiel or Daniel, and you can't mix those all together, that's cool. But you ought to at least be able to tell somebody about Jesus. You ought to at least be able to tell you he died, he was buried, he was raised, he entered into my life experience, and my whole life changed. I heard about him one day, and I came to him just as I was, and he changed my walk, he changed my talking. I ain't stopped cursing yet, but I'm almost there. I don't get drunk as much as I used to. I, I get drunk, but not as much as I used to. I don't respond to every booty call, but, but yeah. I'm in process. If you can't do nothing, you ought to be able to preach the word. You, you ought to be able to say something about what he's done for you. Is there anybody in the room right now who can say, regardless of how deep and far my life is dropped off, it's not where I want it to be, I got to at least be able to say that God has come through, that he's shown up, that he's been there for me when I haven't been there for him? He says, and these people all went about preaching. Well, I can't preach. I ain't been called. Yeah, you've been called. You've been called. I call my sheep by name. You might not have been called to be the pastor, an elder, or a teacher, but Jesus Christ, you ought to be able to say something about the word. And let's walk on over. In verse 4, it says, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Next thing. In the perfect church, God uses our seasons of preparation to send us to our season of proclamation. That if you are still just coming to Bible study, or if you're still just missing Bible study, or if you're still just coming to church, or if you're still just coming every two out of four weeks, and that's good participation for you, that, let me tell you this, you are not a part of the perfect church, not because the church is wrong, it's because you're wrong. Don't evaluate everybody else, you're wrong. How you know, Pastor? Are you preaching the word? Here are over 10,000 people that leave, and it says the text is, and they all went about saying what Jesus had done for them. Now, here's the thing on when they started talking. When somebody died and somebody started getting put in jail and prison, they said, man, we better go keep on talking about this Jesus. And they began to say, watch, I'm going to share about the work of the Lord. I'm going to talk about what he's done. And watch this, pressure had to get put on them. See, what God will do is put pressure on you to get out of you 
what's already on the inside of you. God will put pressure on you to where you can't do nothing but call on his name. Now watch this. There are some women who have been pregnant, have not prayed the whole pregnancy. Some of y'all can't understand that, but they ain't prayed the whole pregnancy. But when delivery day came, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now they ain't prayed the whole pregnancy, but, but labor pain number two, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And push, push. Pressure's applied. Watch this. That baby comes out. Hallelujah. Ain't saying no song the whole pregnancy. But when pressure was applied, hallelujah, it's something about pressure that God will use to get stuff out of you that you're not going to get out of you when it's an easy season. Watch this thing. So God will use a season of preparation. Now, here's the season of preparation. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to prayer. They have devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They were devoted people of God. And now because they were devoted, God said, it's your season. Here's your season. Not your job, not your car, not your new house. It is your season to open up your mouth. After all this training from salvation in Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8, it's your season to open up and tell somebody what Jesus has done. Now watch this. The Bible says they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, that God scattered them to the right places. But that's not the last place he scatters them. See, because he says, I'm going to let y'all go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and I'm going to let y'all get all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, here it is, is that when God scatters them via a persecution, what he's doing is he's, he's saying, I want to get a harvest out of you. There are some people that need to experience your spiritual growth. There are some people that need to see what's happened in your life. Now, I need you to understand something. The Bible says one thing unique, that they all left except the apostles, which means that the apostles' original ministry was in Jerusalem. But it was the people, not the apostles, who went to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, if you know math, we're in math class, that's one place Jerusalem, two places Judea, third place Samaria, fourth place the ends of the earth. If the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, then three-fourths of the ministry was not done by the called preachers, the apostles. Three-fourths of the ministry was done by the people that were sitting, who were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to prayer. So watch this. He said, I want to get y'all out to do three-fourths of my ministry, which means that most most of the ministry is not being done in the facility. The facility is only preparation season for your proclamation season. Where you go to work is where you've been scattered. Your neighborhood is where you've been scattered. Your friends and family, your loved ones, that's where you've been scattered. And the question is, is what does your harvest look like? You waiting on a preacher's license. You waiting on ordination. You, you, you waiting on somebody to lay hands on you in the church and you pass out. That ain't good church. You, you think a real move of God is when somebody comes down the aisle and, you know, and, and dudes fall out. First of all, you didn't even know what, you didn't even know what that meant. Then the dude fell out on the ground and all he did was lay there and they put a little cover on him. And y'all think that's real church. That's because we've been lied to. That ain't no real church. Dude didn't even get up and say nothing about no Jesus. But all these people were scattered and went about preaching the word. Now, can I, can I give you one more? Go to Acts chapter 11 and we out of here. In Acts 11, verse 19, we out of here. It's a real quick point. So then those who were, are you in 11 verse 19? Check out the word coming over from chapter 8. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and to Cyprus and to Antioch. Now watch this, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some men of Cy Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene is in Africa, just so that you know that. Who, went, who, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Now here's the thing, watch this. On this slide, you'll see Jerusalem. And once you see where Jerusalem is on the slide, then you go up and you see Samaria. 
or excuse me, you see Judea and you see, see Samaria. You see that region. But then you see Phoenicia, you see Cyprus, and you see Antioch, the places they went. Now, Antioch is 300 miles from Jerusalem. Phoenicia is 100 miles from Jerusalem. Cyprus is 250 miles from Jerusalem. They had to go across the water to get to Cyprus. But they began to spread out, and the Bible says, and they began to preach the Lord Jesus. And although they were only at first preaching to Jews, then there were some of the men of Cyrene, some Africans, who preached the word to some Gentiles and or some Greeks. So some African folk who were already saved, so those of y'all think this is a white man's religion, that's false. There was already some folk that were saved at Pentecost from Cyrene and Cyprus, whereas Africa is. So now watch this. They began to preach the word of God to other people. And the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. Watch this. In the perfect church, last point, God uses his people to fulfill his purpose while experiencing his power and his presence. Now notice this. They go back out, they go home, and they start preaching. And look at what the text says. They preached the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 8, they preached the word. Acts chapter 11, they preached the Lord Jesus. And many believed, watch this, and the hand of the Lord was with them. He not only holds your hand when you fall, but he also gives you his hand when you call his name. When you call his name and let somebody else know who he is, God's power and God's presence will be with you. Watch. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything that I've taught you, and lo, I will be, watch the text, with you all the way to the end of the world. Did you notice the Bible said the hand of the Lord was with them? Why? Because they began to make disciples of all nations. So anytime you go out to fulfill the call of God, to where you say, everywhere I go, I'm a messenger of God. I don't just have a job. I'm an employee of this company, but I'm a messenger of God for an employee at that company who's going through difficult times, who might need to hear a word through me and not be turned to the app so that they can listen to the pastor. Watch this. The text says they preached the Lord Jesus, and watch this, and the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed. Now, it's already 10,000 spread out, but now notice this. When Stephen's not preaching, when Peter's not preaching, when Paul's not preaching, when John's not preaching, this is Acts chapter 11 now, when the disciples aren't preaching, but when the people are preaching, a large number was also added, which means you don't have to wait on a harvest from pastor because God has designed you for your own harvest. How many people are yet waiting to get to heaven because you ain't opened your mouth? Where is your harvest? You've been scattered. And watch what he says. And the hand of the Lord was with him as they preached the Lord Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth. He said, you'll receive power, dunamis, dynamite, uncontrollable, unimaginable, supernatural power that is beyond your ability. That is the Holy Spirit of the living God who hovered over the surface of the deep that was with Jesus when he called things into existence. When he said, let there be light, and light became light. When he said, let there be land, and land became land. We said, let there be fish, and fish became fish. Now he says, the same spirit that was hovering over the surface of the deep is now living inside of you to give you dynamic power. And you think that power is bench press. You think that power is squat. But he said, here is power. Power is when you go and preach on a Wednesday night. And Corey Miller's listening, and he hears you preaching John 1, 35 through 42, when you're the youth pastor at First Metropolitan Church, and you see Corey's eyes go from here to here, and you realize he just got Jesus. And now Corey goes off to Moody Bible Institute and gets a degree from Moody Bible Institute, and is now leading his family and active in ministry. That's power. 
You know what power is? Power is, is when you go speak, Blake, as the only black person with your wife to eight Chinese churches at a youth retreat, and the Chinese girls hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and is crying uncontrollably, and she can't stop crying two hours after the message is over, and y'all are trying to console her, and she said, I just feel like Chinese girl, I've been washed. That's power. When the Chinese boy at the retreat says, at the announcement time, they come to testimony time, and he has his little, uh, he said, I brought my teachings because my friend brought me here. And my friend brought me here to tell me about Jesus. And I brought my teachings of Buddha. And Buddha says in his teachings, I, uh, if there's another way that's better than me, go to it. He, he said, in Buddha's teachings, Buddha said, if there's another way that's better than me, go to it. And I heard the preacher, that's Blake Wilson, say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so because of what Buddha said and because of what the preacher said, I've come to Jesus. That's power. When I go out there and I'm up in Erie, Pennsylvania, preaching to 250 boys at a basketball camp, and I preach about Jesus Christ, and some boys who were hooping and dunking on folk and shooting threes all start crying with no women around, talking about 24 got saved, coming to Jesus. That's power. And the question is, have you ever experienced power in your life? Have you ever experienced the power of God, the presence of God in your life? The greatest power you'll ever experience is when you open up your mouth and say, guess what? There's a large multitude of number of people that need to know Jesus, and God has planted me. You want to be a part of the perfect church? Open up your mouth and look for the next opportunity to share Jesus Christ with somebody and watch what God will do. When you yield outside of your natural abilities and stop being scared and afraid and open up your mouth and say, Jesus, if you'll just use me in this person's life right now, you'll get the glory. And you will see power that you've never seen before. But you know what most folks see? After a season, they liked your church at first, but then they get bored with your church. This is real. Well, you know, the first three years was good, but now I'm a little bored. And the reason why you're bored at church it's because you ain't seeing no power. Your mouth is still closed. You're still coming to listen to teachings, but you ain't talking about no teachings. You're not talking about the one who saved you. And to be a part of the perfect church, you ought to be thinking about Jesus Christ, who saw you in the pits of hell and where your life really, truly was. Take off all the facades of being in church right now, all your evil thoughts, all your evil deeds and evil actions, and yet anyhow, he reached out to you through the cross and saved you and began to turn you around. And that's when you'll be a part of the perfect church. When your meditation is on how far away I could have been, but now your conversation is about how far he brought me and letting somebody know that Jesus Christ is King of glory, Lord of lords, Lamb of God, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Bright and the Morning Star. And when you begin to let folk know what he has done and who he is, only then will you be a part of the perfect church. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would show your people our role and our